Hi, very good morning to you. It's Gene from Mavstar Observatory. We are getting back to science in this video, guys. We've got a couple of exciting things to talk about. Um, before we do, as usual, I want to say a very big thank you just to a few people um, who have really, uh, one in particular has really uh, kept the observatory afloat. You know, last month was looking dismal, uh, so far behind on a lot of things. And then JBM come along and, you know, just hooked us up out of the water and stopped us really going down. Um, you know, this is, I say this in every video, but I don't think some people really realise, you know, what it takes to run an observatory, even at, um, you know, the micro level that we're at. You know, but even so, we're at this micro level, you know, we pack a massive punch. And um, if just a few more people would realise that, that we really are trying to do um, a fairer service than the bigger organisations for the general public. And, you know, that's why we ask that the general public give us a bit of support you guys out there and um, you know we got a little bit of help from patrons which numbers are dropping on them as well it's just when you see things going backwards it's, it's painful because you know if well in my case it just makes me go even harder forward I'm not a giver upper um, I've proved that to a lot of people I think to date um, you know we've only got one project still on the back burner that we've not finished and I know I can it's just really fitting it all in because it's a complex uh, thing that we're trying to achieve and I'll tell you what that is it's the cloud generator I haven't forgot Cole um, you know it is going to get built uh, it's probably 80% there now it just requires a few other things I mean we bro broke the back on that really when we got the Peltier elements to go down to minus 37 which was you know, 10 degrees Celsius minus more than what we needed for the alcohol vapor to uh, precipitate over the plates and then give us that vapor cloud where we can see the cosmic rays going through. But I haven't forgot that. The other promise is nearly done. Um, the company uh, that is launching that um, around, I think the first launch is planned for the Solstice, believe it or not, uh, next month. But I'll give you more details on that. I have been asked to not talk about that so much. And what we're talking about is the messages launched into space in a capsule of light. So um, there'll be more information. But the point is this. To date, I have, apart from one project, the uh, cloud chamber, uh, not delivered on anything else. So, you know, I hope you find that that one reason, um, you know, to, you know, help help with a little bit of the expenses around here and uh, you know stick with us but super big thank you to JBM and all the others that you know realize it's not easy okay enough said about the running and the funding of the observatory let's get into talking about something exciting check out the atmospheric oxygen uh, we've done the earth self at a glance today um, what that means is we've got various pieces of equipment at the observatory like muon detectors um, atmospheric oxygen sensors and CO2 sensors as well as the TriMag. All this is bespoke equipment to our observatory and what we do is we try and gather as much information, put it down on one page so that you guys can you know, go back um, and just analyse what's been going on week by week or as often as we're able to do the Earth Alpha at a glance for you guys. And all the, de all the details are there before us and I'm just going to go through them but I want you to just check out the atmospheric oxygen because this is the first time I've ever seen such a low reading. Now it's not terribly low, 18.47. You know to see it drop below 21%, it's usually over just over 21% usually, but to see it drop like that for the very first time makes me question um, whether there has been a genuine atmospheric drop in the atmosphere or something is wrong with the Illuminox sensor and we're using state-of-the-art sensing equipment and I don't think there is anything wrong with the equipment because I waited another half hour with the sensor outside running uh, this morning and it came back with a lower reading twice so once it was at 16 something and then it was at 17 something and out of the three I thought well let's just play play it safe let's go with you know the highest reading that we managed to get because that's closest to the 21 percent and you know the reason why i'm mentioning the lower figures is because what when i've built equipment before or i've used other people's equipment i rely on the equipment to give the true reading 
And just because you get an anomalous reading one time doesn't mean that it is a broken piece of equipment. It just means that it's probably just took a low sample rate at that point in time. So I do believe that that is the case here. Um, do I think it's concerning? Well, only if we continually saw, you know, a depletion of oxygen in our atmosphere, I'm sure that we're all going to get concerned about that. But I'm sure that there are hidden uh, natural reasons for that to be the case. Um, as you can see, CO2 is at 436. Nothing there to be alarmed at. If you go over the archive of data on, on um, you know, Earth Alpha at a glance on PulseShiftNews.com, you'll see that that's a standard reading. That's not nothing to be alarmed about. I know that there are um, groups out there, like Extinction Rebellion, that would go, oh, but we are, we are one minute to 12 in dying, but it's not the case. All that's going to happen is vegetation globally is going to thrive even more on our planet. When I brought the um, CO2 detector back into the living room, I, I'd forgot I'd just left it on there for another five minutes on the coffee table. And when I glanced past it, it was at 900 parts per million. So what I'm saying is I wasn't feeling lightheaded. I wasn't going dizzy. You know, the, the, the flowers in the vase weren't drooping. You know, what I'm saying is, you know, we can live in an environment where normally it's at over a thousand parts per million with a couple of people in a small, moderate sized room. We can live, you know, in an atmosphere outside our house, houses, you know, just as comfortably. If we look at artificial commercial growers, they pump CO2 into the greenhouse to get them levels up to around about 1400 parts per million. So there is a reason for it. And that is to make those plants thrive. And if they are doing that for the vegetation and the vegetation is thriving in that environment with more CO2, then is that a bad thing? You know, if we see the deserts in the Sahara and other places around the world going greener, it just means that there's in habitats being created for more biodiversity of species on our planet. So it's not a bad thing. Really annoys me. Climate and, um, you know, um, uh, extremists. That's not the word I'm looking for, the extremist. But, uh, you know, they exaggerate these facts. They're costing taxpayers around the world billions of pounds and coming up with some ludicrous ideas to change our atmospheric composition of gases so that they you know in order you know to reduce carbon in one respect i mean there's even talk now can you believe it of trying to do something about the quantity of nitrogen in our atmosphere because it has been recently shown in a study um one of our you know um subscribers brought it to my attention i looked into it a little bit and uh, yeah they're trying to blame nitrogen now for damaging plant life it's in, it's incredible why don't people just leave things alone and study really what our earth is doing and how it manages its biosphere you know because before human beings over the last 42,000 years was here the planet was doing just fine without us and it will do just fine again without us if we just leave it alone. And that brings me on to the next thing. Let's just quickly get through what we've got here. And then I want to talk about something really interesting with you guys. So we've got uh, the magnetic north pole position. As you know, we take a reading once a month um, because of the work involved in that. So you've got the longitude and latitude of the magnetic north pole from the 17th of last month. That gets dated every month on the 17th. Then we've got the radiation background count, which is just done with an ordinary Geiger counter. Um, and we take a background reading. It was quite funny, about three, uh, three weeks ago, I had a pet TC scan and that went up to 50 microsieverts. When you can see the background radiation is usually at 0 0.015, that's a massive increase. And it's quite interesting. I was doing a bit of, I wish I'd have recorded it now for you guys, because when I went by the Geiger counter closer, it went crazy. And the reason why um, I was radioactive, because they put a radioactive trace in you. If you've ever had a PET TC scan, you'll know what that's all about. So yeah, it was really interesting for, you know, to see the Geiger counter actually working, you know, above uh, these minimal levels and uh, really kick into 50 microsieverts. I was like, wow, you know, that's quite high for ordinary standards but then they do tell you once you have this radioactive tracer put into your body that you're not supposed to go by pregnant women for the day and children so obviously that is the reason why but it was interesting to see how close i had to get to the geiger counter for it to you know kick off 
and I think it was about when I got within about eight feet it really started to light up the counts and I could hear the tubes inside there going you know crazy crackling and uh, you know the readings was like I say really high okay so um, you got our um, volcanoes in eruption um, 28 it's down one from last last time I done the reading it was at 29 before that largest earthquake there as you can see in Indonesia uh, again that's measured over the last 24 hours we only look at the largest earthquake on the day that we do the earth alpha at a glance for you guys it's just to can get as much information as we can to inform you guys of things like earthquakes, CO2, oxygen, magnetic North Pole, etc, etc. Muons, another piece of bespoke equipment which we've purchased, uh, sorry, which we built ourselves, thanks to MIT in America, um, you know, sharing the information on that. As you can see, it's at 503 parts per million. I get slightly different reading from one of our superstars in Canada. He seemed to fluctuate a lot. Mine, I do it once a month or once every other week or whenever we do this. And it's always around about the same. I'm just wondering whether that's because of our geolocation here in the UK, as opposed to Kendall being in one of the, um, you know, the lowest regions, creeping in on one of the lowest magnetic regions uh, on the planet now. Uh, I think... Um, off the top of my head, it's around about 45,000 nanotesla. So, or 45 microteslas. <coughs> so, yeah, um, you know, uh, not too much to worry about with the muons. Uh, sunspot numbers is zero today, uh, which is a change because we have been seeing a bit of geomagnetic uh, field increase where it's been unsettled. Uh, you know, there has been a couple of times where we've seen, you know, the x-rays uh, go from uh, normal to storm uh, but at the moment things are quiet on the disk of the sun no sunspot regions numbered uh, the geomagnetic field is quiet and the solar x-rays are normal and then we've got the jet stream conditions still unstable just want to mention briefly here in the UK we're in May now on the 5th and we've still got temperatures like last night going down to zero might be something to be concerned about and that is what brings us on to the next part of what I wanted to talk to you about. One of the subscribers sent me um, a link to a lecture that had been given in 2015 here in the UK. I'm not going to mention the uh, scientist's name but there was a conglomerate of scientists from a lot of the universities here in the UK and they was talking about the ethics of geoengineering and what his study was was volcanism. He's a volcanologist and he was doing um, samples of you know how volcanoes affect temporal climate so the temperature basically in the vicinity of the volcano and it was noted that it had dropped when there was a you know the temperature had dropped in the vicinity of the volcano uh, and its eruption into the clouds that you know that um, sulfur dioxide had gone in obviously into the clouds and it had made uh, an alteration in the stratospheric clouds which had called the region down and I think part of his um, work from there on was to look for something less toxic than sulfur dioxide that could be added to the atmosphere around the tropic regions of the planet that would cool it down and he was saying and he did find it by the way they found something that they could spray into the atmosphere that wouldn't be toxic to biodiversities on the ground, plant life, etc. And he was talking about, you know, just because we could do it, should we? He was talking about the ethics of it. And because the uh, topic um, attracted a lot of um, enthusiasm, both in support and against um, it, that was one of the reasons why he drew people to this meeting to discuss the ethics and you know it's rare to see and I think it's a really good thing when scientists talk about the ethics but my question here is look at today and it's not just here in the UK that these temperatures have been recorded for you know the first time in a very long time in over 100 years or even uh, on record uh, that you know we get to almost the middle of the year 
and we see these temperatures of minus zero when they should be warm but I, I mean I've been explaining to people you know with the pushing of the jet stream arctic winds and temperatures being uh, brought lower down latitudes on faster traveling jet streams sometimes uh, you know broken jet streams is what we've got is really in a simple way of explaining it you know you're going to get these temperatures but you would also get these temperatures if substances had been injected into the tropic regions of our planet and it would affect in, in turn upper higher latitudes um, and continents now most of Europe has been experiencing this extra cold weather my question is did they do it was they just talking about the ethics in 2015 and then decide it was the right thing to do because if that's the case my personal opinion on this is you are screwing with the nature of this planet and you've only been here you know a very short space of time when you compare the life of our planet and before that it was doing a great job on its own and now it's like you're saying it's disabled it's malfunctioned and based on the you know data that you've got to hand you believe it's because of humans it's crazy it's absolutely crazy just leave nature alone i wish i'm a scientist and i'm saying just leave nature alone you know we're not at critical levels where we start needing to do things like this it is good to experiment and have it on a back burner just in case you know it's a life or death situation the world will die without that you know without that input from human beings and then you know you even have to ask the question is well did we serve our time here on earth already and should we still do that but whatever uh, is the argument here i just don't think we're even close to having to do things like that but my what i question is did they already do it because i know that when the manhattan project was going on there was very little ethics ethics, ethics being um, used and deployed there because the scientists well the manhattan project as you know was the development of the atomic bomb and scientists wasn't even sure that, you know, by detonating the first atomic bomb, it was going to ignite the atmosphere. Yeah. Can you believe we did it? Tested it. And, you know, that's why I say ethics is really important in science and we should use it. But at what point do we overcross the line and say, let's go for it? I'll leave you to uh, give that some thought and uh, please share that those thoughts in the comment section. I'm going to end it here, guys. There's a link down there if you want to help support the observatory. I would greatly appreciate a few more people stepping up because I do feel that a lot of you have value at what we do here. You know, we had 10,000 people uh, view our website in the last week and, you know, it would just be nice if a few more people had used that link on there and uh, use the link down there in the description. And we'll keep delivering and bringing you the data on the changes of our Earth in simple formats like Earth Alpha at a glance or the, you know, the, on the 17th as we do the magnetic pole position. So you have a great day. Links down there. And as always, guys, bye for now.